Yeah. Ready? Yeah. So, okay. So, that, that's for Wednesday night. That Sunday morning, boy, my church was packed. The folks was slammed on the hood. I was pricking them and running the church for years. So we were talking about so. So, so uh, it was it was terrific. So I said that. So I got there that Sunday morning, and so I didn't have no deacons. And the one deacon that was friendly with me, he died that same week. It was too much for me. Mm. And I had to ask the Lord, my spirit, Lord, where are you? What's happening? But I never lost. Because, see, I believe if, if you do what's right and what's just and fair in any situation, then that's going to be taken care of. And, and people have to understand the biggest and the best things in life are not done really by us. They're done for us. And so they were there. So that's Sunday morning. Lord, church, pay no them saying, so sit on that same <laughs> Oh, but I want to tell you this, um, uh, during the conference, Pritchard got up and said, yeah, many, many, uh, I'm back at the conference, mm -hmm. many notes that I signed for him, so he signed, I got bought a hundred dollars in the bank, and he countersigned. I said, what does that got to do with this? I said, but since you brought it up, tell the people how many times you had to pay in it. So I always paid my notes ahead of time. You know how much I had to pay all that? Well, I didn't have to pay nothing. I said, if you just come or something. Okay. I said, have you ever read where the Bible says, don't do your arms to be seen? Amen. I said, but well, did you have to pray a little bit more? Because if you didn't do it out of the spirit of right and helpfulness, you still didn't do it right. I said, but I had no place in this. Thing. And you can't do that to buy somebody. I'm not to be bought. Mm -hmm. That is significant. Yeah, I said, you can't, you can't buy me. You can't buy my boy. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like John the Baptist, the boss of him that cried the world, and I'm going to speak the truth with God. So, that night, Pritchard got up and said to them, y'all going to go to the court, y'all going to go to anything you want to get. Now y'all get up his money. I said, brother, if I had wanted you to resign, that would be the first thing that I had would to find a deacon. I said, I am that. I said, I can work with you if you can work with me. I said, so I didn't ask that. So you don't have to resign. We just have to establish a relationship. No, no, no. I don't resign. I can't. I can't. No, no, no. When he got up, then Ben Harris got up. Then uh, Dan, then did all eat up. And I had to say, Lord, where are you? And then when this man died in that week. So then uh, that Sunday morning, as the Lord would have it, I had spoken to, I think I got six men to agree to serve as temporary deacon. If I know like I know not, I'd vote as permanent deacon. So that Sunday morning, boy, I done preaching, got everything, ready to go home. I said, because of the action of the former deacon, the church does not have any deacons at this time. I said, I'm calling the following men down to the front of the church. When you come down, brothers, I'll call your name. So I call six. So I said, come into the front. I said, I recommend to the church that these men serve as temporary deacons. Now in that in that uh, church, they sit around the pulpit, which was kind of around facing the audience. Mm -hmm. So when they voted in, they started to go back up there. I said, no, oh, damn, y'all sit out here now. Face the audience, y'all are deacons. <laughs> so I'm asking the foreign person stand, I call your name. I'm recommending these be ward leaders. And uh, and sure enough, then I stood up and dismissed it. The trade went on. That was, uh, who, who was that? I'm trying to see what month. October. It had to be October. Same thing as Carlos. We took out those 15 years in the World Series. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew I was going to leave the church anyway. I was just about tired of that. So in um, November, I went to Mobile. And T.J. Hale, Pastor Amwell, had said he was going to somewhere in, uh, but I should tell you this, this is, this is where really the Lord let me, this is, this is the closest thing to my conversion, and that might have been the balance of it. During this situation at First Baptist, when I tell you, I went to do that revival, it was, uh, was that the season? 
It was at a time of convention, and we had to be on a train. So it had to be in either September. Yeah, September, same time I came back and told Fitch to go to hell. I was on the train going to the convention. And you know how people joke and tell lies and on the train. Little Negro from Gaston, Alabama, had joked and lied all the way to California, almost. And we were on the train that night. And I had not been able to sleep in, in really weeks, I guess. And it looked like when I go to sleep, something would be just doing this to me. And it was problem going to school, studying, trying to do. But I trusted in God. So I was on this train and uh, I sat and talked to them. After a while, about one, two, three o'clock more, everybody goes to sleep anyway. I sat in my seat and tried to go to sleep and couldn't. Everybody was on the train. So I went the length of that train to see if anybody was woke, awake that I could talk to. And nobody was awake. Mm -hmm. Six or eight cars. And so then I decided I would go and get in the end of the car, you know, where those hand doors. Yeah. So I was going to look out and see what we were passing, since I couldn't talk to anybody. And it was black dark. I didn't think about that. And I tried to look out, and the train was going so fast, water was cut out your eyes, so I couldn't look out. Mm -hmm. So I stood up in the end of that train and said, these words of this said, Lord, now, I don't know why you sent me like that. I said, I had the rural churches, I was teaching school, and I was doing well, and I was satisfied I was doing your will. I said, somehow or another, you decided to send me to first Baptist for your own purpose, I guess. I said, but now you know the situation, I went to tell you. I said, and I realized that all through the Bible I read that people who really follow you have had to suffer. Some kill. I said, now I'm willing to do that. I said, I don't even mind my family suffering. I said, but one thing I want you to do, fix me so I won't worry. And honestly, I must say to you, it looked like somebody just, while I'm talking, lift that whole trend. All for me. Mm. I went right back to my seat and said, I want to sleep. Mm. That same, I knew then it was the Lord. Oh. Oh. That was one of the most powerful, except in that bomb blast and two, three other things. Mm. But God was getting me ready. Mm. And when that looked like that whole train just lifted off of me, mm. and I knew it was the Lord, I went back and sat down and went to sleep and ain't worried about that. That day is So then, uh, uh, I'm, I'm in Mobile and I'm, I'm in Hale, I had to go to Florida to preach. And I wanted to go to Florida. Somehow I wanted to go to Pensacola. Where did you say you were in Mobile? I went to Mobile for a visit. Okay. Not, not, I wasn't living in Mobile. See, I was living in Selfridge. And Martin, I had gone down to either, uh, See, at, at, by the end of November, I, I just I just walked away from church, you know, and during December. And and I went to Mobile, and Marlon said to me, he said, T.J. Hills is going to uh, Pensacola to preach that afternoon service. And he said, I'm going to let you preach so you can be heard. So that was good for me. That's why I went. I just didn't tell him I wasn't coming back to church that day. So, um, so T.J. said to me, he said, well, you don't have to go now. He said, you do what you need to do, and I will, uh, I can get you an appointment down there, which satisfied me. So I came on back to Birmingham, and for months, see, it's only a, a month that I wasn't passing. I owe my father and everything. So you actually left first at the end of the year and went to Mobile. Didn't go to Mobile to preach. Then. Yeah. This was the visit. I was I was going to Florida that day. Mm -hmm. See. 
That was either the end of November or the first of January. It, was, it wasn't long. It wasn't too long after that conference, but I had the thought and I took it with me. I think right. they were disappointed I left. Mm -hmm. But I just didn't want to. Because, see, they wanted those old deacons put back. Mm -hmm. And that's really what made me decide. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, not to stay and keep fighting. Right. Uh, so the church wanted those old deacons back in there. That's why you said it would have been more of a case if you had put those men in. Permanent, permanent, right. See, you had two preachers there. Emmett, who was a great Bible teacher, and this old man. Uh, they told me to call the conference. I said, well, uh, folks that have been here with me, they just want, they just want the deacon back. You know how mm -hmm. people would sympathize. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't say anything at first. Uh, and I did say to one of them, I said, well, they haven't asked to come back. You know. But, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what did I finally make a decision, but I, I let it be known. I didn't care about them coming back because I didn't put them all in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think I did. At, in, at the end of, uh, what was it, the end of December, I said, well, okay, at the end of December, they want to come back and work with me, fine. But I had made up my mind that if they come back, what are you to be standing there fighting the battle all over again? Although I could have, I'm sure. Right. As I look at it now, I could have, if I did it then, I could have done it over. Mm -hmm. But I knew that they would do everything they could to, to cut out, you know, people. Aside, the Lord had had me do my work then. All he wanted to do was show them that he can get the victory there. The Lord doesn't have to, you know, he, he doesn't cram on us. He just overcomes us and then he we work was us. done. My work was done. And I was conscious. So I think it was in, in either December or early January, I went, came to Birmingham to live. And uh, my uh, mother, who had a church in Mobile, had been called the Bethel Baptist. Now look at how God does things. You must not ever leave him out of the equation, because he is the equation. And uh, I was waiting on uh, Reverend Hale to call me to come back. So when Molly called, I knew he wanted me to come over here and go. He said, Fred, see, I've been called to Bethel in Birmingham now. He said, and uh, I can't come. I got a some kind of program. I said, I want you to go to Bethel and preach. This was the either the first Sunday in February or second Sunday in February. What is this, 53? 53. See, 52 may end anything. Right. right. I said, okay, I'll go. I said, but I thought I wanted to go to, I thought we'd go away. He said, well, Hale said he'll get you an appointment, but I need to go, then I can't go there, so you go. So it was a matter of urgency. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I, I remember so well, I went there that day, and they didn't know me, and I didn't know them. Uh, and uh, I preached, um, what was it? Uh, Mm. I don't need my tongue, I'll think about it. Mm. Uh, at any rate, they cared on so them a soul. And I was embarrassed, you know. But I never considered myself a great preacher, even to this day. And, oh, we, we like that man. We, 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 we heard him, we never want to talk. And they want to talk to me, so I said, no, I can't discuss anything with you. You have a pastor call. And, well, give us your address. I said, no, I don't need my address. Just ask him. I said, God, I don't play with churches. And he said he couldn't come and he would be here next week or whatever. And so that's the way I turned it off. And the very next Sunday morning of that week, Molly called me again. He said, Fred, they want you back at Bethel. I said, Molly, now wait a minute. I said, now what are you going to do? I, I am not going back. He said, fool, you don't know this may be the law. <laughs> I said, I don't think the law won't be paid in no church, my man. I said, I, I, I better not go. He said, well, at least go, you, you need to get something to get you some bread, some food with. The grocers are used well. He said, I promise I won't ask you to go again. I said, okay. I said, I'll go this time. But I'm telling you now, I will not go back again. He said, okay, go on. So can I tell you, Cutters? Yeah, okay. Man, they were that answer. Mm -hmm. They were 
Chapter was that? Standing up, yeah. And so I preached on, uh, oh, oh, that June. God teaching in an amazing way, but the Spirit of God teaches us that denying God that good and us, we should, we should present our bodies to something like that. And that Sunday when I went and, uh, and, and, and I guess I wasn't preached on 20 minutes. And, and so I just had this literally walk out from them, not talk to them. And he said, uh, uh, that he would, he would, he told me, tell me he would see them the next week. I said, well, so he'll see them next week. So I just left. I was almost rude. Because I had no idea that I would get to church. I wasn't thinking about it. I, my mind's in fraud. Mm -hmm. See? And, uh, and had been a fraud. <laughs> so, uh, he was to meet them that Thursday night, following that shopping Sunday, Thursday and whatever it was. And that night it came up a rain, it was a torrent. It was, it rained so till you just couldn't hardly drive. People in the street, I understand, could have to stop. But the church met out there. And Martin sent them a telegram that he could not come. And they called me unanimously in the rain. It was God's appointment. So when I got there, I didn't have to, I didn't have to deal with it. I've had some dealing, I heard had straight a few things I have to. But that one was a, and, and, and uh, so I go there and, and, and start, I go there and start on the first Sunday. Now, you know, just the last one there. Oh, man, see, it was guilty church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Passed for the longest time. It was Reverend Laster. Right. And uh, stayed there 10 years and died there. I think I was there 30. Pastor. They have a man named Gamble for a few months. Mm -hmm. So when I went out there, I talked to Sage Parker, who was at 32nd Street Church at this time. And I was telling him about making recommendations so strong, and he said to me, he said, I'm afraid they are not first Baptists. Mm -hmm. He said, you don't need to fight them. Let's, let's say what you want to do. It. But I'm ready to fight. You can get in the mood you so I went out there and uh, and really Bethel was one of the greatest churches. Except the one I got now, which came out of another fight. Mm -hmm. Looked like it's been mine to fight inside and outside all my life. Mm -hmm. When I get to heaven, I'm going to cry. <laughs> but anyway, when I got there, they just were unanimous with it. They were, they were, they were in exuberant and so forth. Well, God has problems with preachers sometimes. They get involved in things you don't need. So you have to fight this person, that person. At any rate, uh, without telling it all, there was a man there who was involved with some woman in the church that the pastor was involved. And the pastor liked to go and fish a lot, as I understand. I don't know, but that's what they say. And so he would get up when the pastor would take his text and contest him in the church. What you take that text? That church is that text is set on the fires of hell. This and that. That's what I understand. So Walter Block and two, three others said, now he's gonna show, he's gonna show do that. I said, Well, let's pray for him and let's hope he doesn't. Don't, don't uh, maybe he won't. But you see, you must remember now I'm 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 burning the fire in Sodom. And I'm still determined not to run over people. So um, the first Sunday I preached as pastor, uh, he got up and he said, uh, ah, once that, once that is, we got a great pastor. I remember, we've been here preaching like that all the time. We be somewhere. I remember, I didn't come in. So the next Sunday he made comments about the good pastor. We got good pastor, don't follow. So the third Sunday when I got up, I said, now let me say something to the church. The gospel is to be lived more than commented on. Your comment on the gospel is your living it. 
I said, after the day when I preach, it's period. Nobody says anything about it. I said, need no comment to make it good or bad. He says, it's good living. If it's not, if it's not good, pray for me. Well, that cut him off. But he's, the devil is still in a person until it comes up to a crisis. Very seldom a person will just take the law and go. It's amazing. It's amazing to me how God allowed the devil to always challenge him, but he, he knows himself, I guess. So, in their day, Sue Trinson School and Deacon. And honestly, from, from March until December, that church just went like a, like a, Five. And uh, that was 53. Well, you know, in 54, the decision. So, but I was still concerned about, even before 54, church being involved in community affairs. So uh, I was alert that this guy may, may do something. I couldn't cut him up. I thought that would be enough to let him know that I wasn't a candidate. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this should have known, let them know the kind of person I was. The same one who the mission president, one of the most popular women in the church, and a deaconess chairman. In October, they were supposed to be getting women they chant. They went to hear clash about one of them had an umbrella, and had a bridge, gonna fight. So I called them both and said, I said, well now, you know, um, it's all over now that y'all fighting in the church. I said, I don't think that kind of church is all over. I said, now, uh, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the speaker. Be the one you need to get one. I said, now, you have to, since they know you won't, you're going to fight the church, they also will have to know that you can apologize to the church for it. I said, and I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to demand, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I am telling you, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, then I'll do what I must. And that means if you don't get up and apologize for the church, I'm wrong. As part I will suspend each one of you for the church while you take my tip. I said, so I'm making it plain. It ain't threatening you, I hope. I said, but if you're Christian, the Bible said, only yourself, you in the Bible. And you know, amazing, they said, well, all right. I said, you realize you didn't realize you know? I said, well, look, I give you a chance to apologize. At least the, the world will say, if you get wrong, you. So she's saying confess, you So sure enough, they got up at some more. I said, two sisters, we got two sisters who loved each other so much till they began to express it the wrong way. So uh these sisters are coming for the church now. Express that sorrow for that misactions. So they, they got it. People grown people ain't never grown up children, you know that. <laughs> and uh uh Giving new round and Blanche Robinson. And and one of them had, had involved it, you know, both of them. So then uh, I said, uh, they have something to say. So they apologize. So neither my I said, no, I'll go ahead and apologize if you're going to. Yeah. All right, now you all apologize. I said, I'm going to shake hands. So they uh, I said, no, when you shake hands, you grab hands and grip them. I said, I don't want nobody to put their hand in mine. So they gripped his hand. I said, well, then why don't they just go and hug each other and show folk that we love? Mm -hmm. That's what I can do. And they did. Mm -hmm. And that ought to show people that you don't take. Come up to the end of December, as the Lord would have it. And it's amazing how you remember this. There was another young lady. Well, she wasn't. She was on our end. On our work. Way on our work. And she was kind of crazy. She walked kind of, and she was, I had said I wanted to choir to march in from the front door. You know how Bethel is, bitch. You've been out there. Instead of coming from the back. Mm -hmm. And I said, now everybody be in the march. Don't, don't, don't just switch. So she won't be switching in like you know there or something. And so then one month, the second summer, she missed the march. And she'd come pushing down the road. I walked to the edge of the pool and I said, sit right over there, dear. But she didn't come. <laughs> I know, I know I had to, I had to burn him up, but he didn't turn. Uh, so, uh, last Sunday, December 1952, the church raised 
three hundred some more than ever raised than one some, except the rabbit. And we were back in the back. We were getting ready to, and, and I had kind of told her, I had a name on my mind. She was dark, and one of her teeth was kind of off, off with you, had a big gap that dark. And Bertie Funderburg, the one that was present, uh, they wouldn't work with her. So the program wasn't the way it ought to be, but it was, wasn't too bad. And so after the program, I was saying, now, let's come to the conclusion that I believe anybody in the church that's too big to work with other folks is too little to lead. So that's the position I take in the church. And I hope that we don't have anybody here like that. I hope that we do our best and all, because you don't have a one time to do any one thing. And I'm talking, it's like, I'm about finished. And um, I said, uh, let's pray hard. And to, so I'm just about ready to close out and go home. All of a sudden, he's in the back, he's in the choir. And it's rolling in. And, and we had what real good. We drove into the convention. This went real good. This shocked me that he would do this. But pass me, I said, Word, I'm talking. I said, No, sir, you may not. I didn't even look at him. I expect him. He said, uh, how come I can't talk? I said, because I'm talking and you and I can't talk in the church at the same time. Never looked back yet. He said, now I don't remember here and I'm gonna talk. I said, I'm pastor here and you am, you're not gonna talk because I'm not gonna give you the phone talk. I said, now would you kind of, then I looked back, I said, well, would you kind of brother David? He said, so I go on to worship. I said, because you are in the <laughs> Now, uh, I'm going to talk. Now, I wear my pants. I say, here's the question of who wears pants or what pants. It's a question is that you're out of order. Disturbance. And the deacon would call him and he said, Tell him, Davis, you're out of order, son. You're out. He said, You little weak fella, don't bother me. He's like a bull. He's been a bull in the woods, you know. Mm -hmm. So I didn't say anymore. He stood up there and so, so he just stood up and didn't say anything. So about, oh, I guess 10 seconds. I looked like it. felt like a minute. But I wasn't letting him talk. I looked at him, and after a while he said, I'm. I said, now the church will have to speak on this. You can't have this. I said, I understand this is the routine of the past, but the past won't go in the future. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt sorry for him because, see, he had been one of the most avid workers with me for some school convention. But what caused him to do this at this point? Well, Things building up. Number one, he couldn't get up and just make comments. He didn't well, know, that's what he was used to do. Don't care what the church was doing. He knew about taking a text and he'd get up. And then he was involved with two of the women that uh, was involved. This little pressure one and plus yeah. this big and do run. Mm -hmm. And the pastor was involved also with big and do run. Mm -hmm. That's how I understand. So, uh, after this mission, we always go back in the back and sort of say what to do with the money. And, and uh, I remember saying to him, Brother Davis, you interfered with uh, my ministry tonight. And I have, you have come to see me and we talk about that. He said, you said too much. I said, not up, you tell me what to say, not how much. If they hurt me, I speak up. I said, that sounds like a woman. We don't have no women on Deacon Lewis. I said, but anyway, you come see me this week. Now, it was my idea to let him uh, come and understand, just try to explain what he'd been done, how I thought about it. And I was just going to let him get up and say a few words to church the next Sunday morning and forget it. But he's a big man. See, he, this, he just is swirled up. So he didn't come. I said, now be sure to see me. And then after we just, I said, but they be sure. I'm expecting to see you this week. So he didn't come. He told us, no, I ain't going. So the next Sunday morning, I got been read a brief writing I had written over. And I took him out of all of his offices. And boy, this girl, the fun bird, when I told you, she was in the choir. She just, I said to myself, the Lord is squeaking hell out of him. <laughs> well, it had to be. But uh, so he didn't, so so and I had appointed the assistant superintendent to take over that next Sunday morning. And I got word he was gonna be, I didn't go to Sunday school every Sunday. 
But I just went over there and sat down. He came with all his books and things, sat right by me. I really felt sorry for him. You know. Felt sorry that he had it done. He didn't try to fix so Robert Thomas got up and can't do the sun school just like everybody else. Because if he had been there, I was going to tell him to sit down. But he didn't try to. So he was super tennis. He was super tennis and a deacon mm-hmm. in the church. Mm-hmm. But I took him out of it. Mm-hmm. So this is a week later, see. So this week he comes to me after this son came and said, I'm talking. And he said, I said, well, why did you why did you come last week? Well, I said, no, you don't really have an excuse. So don't try to make up one. I said, you were too big to come, weren't you? I said, so you forced me to do what I had to do. I said, my job, and then I have to read Jeremiah. I said, pull down, destroy, tear down, build. I said, that's what, I said, you full of hot air balloons, and I, I puncture balloons. That's my job. I said, I haven't done nothing personal to you. I just had to let you know that you ain't God. And people, you've been a big bull in the woods, and so ain't no bull in the church. He said, yeah, I recognize, I realize you the pastor and all of us are servants. I said, no, all of us are equal. We have different jobs. I said, I wish you had come last Sunday, because I hate I had to do what, what, what I did, because we've been working together. You've been acting like a Christian, but you were a devil on the with sheep clothes. I said, so I had to unfrock that. Yeah, well, you were right, and I was wrong. I said, so now you, you, you admit you were wrong. Yeah. I said, well, I don't want to crush you. I said, I'm I can't make any promises to you. I said, I wish you had done it last week and I wouldn't have had to do it. I said, but I'll go ahead and pray over whatever to be done. I said, I won't make you any promise. I already knew I would put it back later on, but, but maybe not the next Sunday. Because he had what? He wasn't a rabbit. He just, just said himself. So then, um, during the week, well, Charlie Watson, my fondest memories of his, his skin is smoother than any woman, you see. They have a one two. Go sick all the time, laugh all the time. And he would almost do anything. He said, Well, he said, he said, so bad. He said, You know, I, I, I would never tell you what he does. He said, If you can find possible to let him know you might restore it. He said, And, and I make more than if he does. I said, No. If I put him back, I'm going to fix it so nobody has to make a motion. I said, no, no, no. We don't go through this same thing over. I said, I said, if I ever put him back, and I won't even promise you that I'm going to do that. He said, well, how many things? I said, but if I do, it'll be so that if he does anything like he's automatically, not only out of deep, but he's voted out the church. Without the church, the church will vote on that. No matter vote on him the most. He said, okay, whatever you do, he said, I, I said, I'll tell you what you do, you pray, pray for him, and pray for me. So I'd already known I'd put him back, so that Sunday morning, I never will forget. <laughs> He's in his black robe, back in the choir behind me, the same place he was when he up got out of the And before I preached, I said, Brother Davis, I'm going to give Brother Davis one minute to come to the floor and make a statement to the church and to the pastor. And upon the basis of what he does, I will have a recommendation to the church. So, and I almost said this, when he came down, he took out his watch so he could be sure he didn't know. <laughs> and I really felt sorry for him. And uh, he took out his watch in his hand, was looking at his wife. He said, well, I want to apologize to the church and to the pastor. I realized I was wrong. And I realized I didn't have to sell what I said and did, but I was wrong. And uh, I won't church for you, and I won't pass for you. And I, I promise, I said, now, Brother David, do you understand what you're doing? I said, because it's always a temptation to go back and do over again. I said, you just did for me what you've been doing, but the other pastor didn't have to put up with that. See? I said, you do it again if you follow the devil. I said, but... Um, I want you to say that. I said, and you must understand that now, before you do anything else, if you do it again, you won't have the opportunity to do it again. Because I, if if my recommendation is that that the church 
accepts your pardon and votes you back into your position with the understanding that if you do the same thing again, you're not only out of office, but you are voted out of the church. Do you understand that? I said, that means we won't vote on you no more. You accept that? Yeah, it's all right. The emotion is like that. See? Went back up the stand. I never had no more trouble out of him until I got ready to leave the church. Then that's a story to say. Well, that's that's the biggest thing. But that church went on and I got him civil rights. He got Let me ask you, though, before we get into that, because I think that may be may be never going to play. But when you got to Collegeville, what kind of community was it? Complacent community, accepting uh, segregation as it is. There were a lot of uh, dives and den, liquor dens and things like that. Police operated a lot of them. <laughs> um, trains, uh, the block traffic, still do something now, but Anytime you go anywhere and be blocked a half hour. I remember once we went Trinity Church right across the river, and the police were trying to get to the train stood there a half hour building burned down. Um, there was no communication between Negroes and City Hall except pimps from Blue County, I think. And uh, we had a lot of uh, ditches and uncovered. It, it was. But you know, God has people, God gets people ready, and we don't know it. Mm -hmm. See, we we be ready. That scripture in Hebrew where it says God moves at sundry times, periodic. Mm -hmm. He does, and he has a final person. I always say uh, God has to give his contracts away to people who got faith. That is, people who will exercise their belief by acting on it. Then it gets into trust. Three steps. Belief, faith, and trust. That's what Paul got when he said, I'm persuaded to nothing. You know. And 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 so I went there with zeal. I had no inkling that the civil rights movement was coming. I had no, I didn't ask for that. You know. But now, although you had gone through some fire and storm yeah. in your churches, yeah. And went through a lot more in Revelation. I know you talking about some tough stuff. That was but mm -hmm. no, go ahead. What about, that, yeah, what about what about um, your relationship throughout all this period with white people? Had you the only one that you mentioned really was the, the, the old man that owned the church. Yeah. And you need to pay hey, you, you 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 made that agreement with him. Did you have any any problems with whites or with police prior to coming to Birmingham? Uh, the I didn't have a lot of relationship with white people. Uh, I went uh, in a man's field up, up there around the Edward Lake where I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Holy, oh, last man, when you left, yeah, two or three days I went up there. Mm -hmm. And I remember Newt Hubbard and what Corp Blade was, was the constable who. Uh, Put my brother and me in jail after my father died, and we wouldn't. They listened for the distillery, but we wouldn't distill the the the, the, the worm cord condensed was on the property. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, but that had never happened to to your father. To the no, no. Did he pay the police off? He was dead. Yeah, I mean before before that. Why didn't they not? Uh, well, they never catch him. You know, I got some interesting anecdotes. If I tell you one, you'd laugh. Uh, my father would, would, would get up and run the liquor off a full day in the morning. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, one time. And, and, and it felt like it'd be so cold. The side of our house that I slept on was as high as these lights, higher. You're about high in the ceiling. And the floor would be so cold. My papa, he, he'd get up and get ready to get to mash, take it and put it in a vat and burn fire, you know, and so forth. Hoping the police wouldn't catch it. Mm -hmm. And we had a, we had a, we had a, and he was rushing me, you know. 
Oh, come on, somebody need to pop a cut. Like, come on, damn it. So, oh, that's life. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had a skull cap on. I never would forget it. I'm going to run tonight. No, that means running late. And I never could be fast enough for him. So it happened at this night that it had sort of drizzle rain. And rain, it was cold enough for the rain to make ice on the boards and things. We had a board across us. <laughs> and when I passed the hog pen, we had two boards across a stream. And when you walk into a path long enough, it becomes wide water there. So we had these boards across us. And he, he didn't know it was ice. <laughs> Papa was telling me, "Come on, God, damn it, I got the rook. And so he went on and hit that. He hit that. Uh, that on that ice and spread it, broke through the ice and the water. And he got it and said some words that I don't want to repeat. <laughs> but he did say he went went back down to bed and big fight and down the mile around the night. <laughs> and Mama was mad and I was too. We had a big fight and stand before the fire. Mm-hmm. But he, this was what he did, you know. Mm-hmm. He 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 uh. He was consistent, I guess, in what he was and what he did. Right. Yeah. So, but he was never, he was never caught by the police. He went to jail twice. The only time I remember my stepfather going to church was that right after or before he had been in jail. And I don't know whether, whether, whether they actually caught him or not, because I was never caught with him. Right. For some reason, he went to jail. I remember him going there twice in those years. Mm-hmm. The time I was three or four up to 18. Right. So mm-hmm. you had to help him with that trial, with, 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 with making him. Oh, yeah. We get a tub and he, see, you, you, you put the barrel in the ground, put your uh, rye and other stuff, and it was ferment, you know, ferment, mm-hmm. yeast and stuff. Mm-hmm. And we give it out and carry it and put it on a drum and then heat the drum and the steam comes mm-hmm. off the hot water. And Comes through the worm is it is the thing where it, mm-hmm. as it goes through the cold water it distills into liquor mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and you know I could I could have made liquor I could have been a great liquor maker and it's it, I thank God on another side of my life I never tried to like it now I tasted two three times it would always do me like medicine so I never had a taste for it mm-hmm. so when you and your brother then were arrested for the circumstances. Papa had died. Oh, I guess we could bury him about within the space of within the space of three months. Maybe it was a month, as I recall now. And uh, the people who live right above us, they had also made it the Santa Fields. And we kept the one on the edge of our line right under some bushes like. And um Mama thinks that they turn us up, that they call them. But anyway, Newton Hubbard, Newton Hubbard, the deputy said, mm-hmm. came. He said, oh, an awful right in front of good store from that year. And he was standing up there, and I didn't know I was a young too, me, me and my brother. I mean, Fred and Jane, Mama was there. But I know him like I did now, but I was a kid. Fred that one. So I turned up and told her under the thing. If I'd known, mm-hmm. I wasn't sad. Right, right. I would never know, but he went and picked it up, so he took us to jail for, for that. My brother was younger than I am. He's five years younger, so he went to juvenile, and I went to in the court because I was 18. I was over 18. My father died when I was 18. He was dead. So uh, he took the woman and got us for distillery. We went to distilling. But at that time, the system could make a case and do not. The system does not make cases out of anything. Right. We were no more distilling than you are. It was just happened to have been on your property. The, 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 the call was on the edge of our property. Mm-hmm. So you think that there's a possibility that somebody told about it. It's a strange, he didn't arrest Mama. I don't know why. It looked like she should have been the one. Mm-hmm. But that's the way it was. You know, uh, in the record, of the, they had this. Uh, Playing paper, you remember, uh, here, Wizard of Five something mm-hmm. years ago, mm-hmm. and they put in, and way back when I first started the civil rights thing, but I was a distiller. <laughs> and so I didn't yeah. know. Yeah, oh yeah, that was in there. The clan knows about you. Yeah. Okay, so they, they check your background. Check my background, yeah. Well, Fred, at what point did you register to vote? 
I'm in Mobile, Alabama. John L. LeFleur was a Negro who agitated for voting and this and that. Then he blew the Stone Street Baptist Church. And as I told you, people who met me could see something in me, and I, I guess I didn't know myself. But he told me, you ought to vote. Uh, I don't know how I met him. I think I met him through Harold, one of my friends who would drive a truck, who would drive a truck too. And I went to a meeting and I met him. And I always admired people who, who stood up for something. It's just been a, and um, was this during the time when you left here going down to work? I was in Mobile. Mobile. Yeah, I was in Mobile. Because you were working at the uh, yeah, Air Base. At the Air Base. Mm -hmm. And there'd be some type of community meeting. It could have been on Sunday or something, but I met him mm -hmm. and I told him I was innocent. So he he got me, uh, called me to rest in Mobile. So I rested in 1940, what was it, 40, it would have been in 44 mm -hmm. or 5. So when you came back to Birmingham, I was old already registered to vote. Yeah. So you didn't have to uh, to re-register. I had to re-register in Birmingham, as I recall. Okay. See, I see you vote by district. District, right? See, so I would have had to register here. I would have had to transfer. No way I could have registered in Jefferson County. And I'm, I, I, it's it's unclear to me at the moment. I can do some thinking. I've been through so many things. Sure. And so many detailed things, so sometimes you forget how mm -hmm. you, but I would have had to register in Justin County. Mm -hmm. But you don't remember right offhand with those circumstances much. I really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember getting a lot of others registered though. Right. Yeah. So you actually now work with the NACP. Oh, yes. And, and, and a little bit in Mobile. Mm -hmm. That's when I met the floor. I was always. Uh, Moved by the character of people who try to put it, and 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 somehow that I had the basic understanding the system wasn't right, mm -hmm. and it may be strange, you know. Uh, most people who talk to me expect would have expected that, given my history now, I would have done something terrible way back there, killed somebody, blown up a house or something. But you see, God has everything in his own time. Mm -hmm. I accepted segregation as a way of life. I never thought it was right. Mm -hmm. I never thought anybody was superior to me. I've never been inferior in my mind. But I knew that the law said it then. Mm -hmm. Just like when Newt Hubbard was there, I recognized him as law. So had I talked to Mama for it, she said, don't tell him. I wouldn't have, but I wasn't. I was an immature. Mm -hmm. uh, But I always believed in my court that segregation was wrong. Uh, even the people in Mobile that, that were so nice and influenced me to come to Corinthian Church, they had white folk they worked for, and I could see the difference, you know, white people. Were, and somewhere in my, you asked me about my conscience of white people. Uh, I believe it was Joe that drove the bus, killed a black man, Negro we call ourselves then. And Joe's only character witness in the court, when we went there, well, we would have gone bus driving, was a white woman who got said Joe was a good nigga. And he got off. Hmm. Where was this? In here in Jefferson County. Hmm. Okay. And he got off based upon her testimony. He was a good nigga. He was a good nigga. Hmm. And then, then I see now I did work, uh, I did work a lot around white folks. I think uh, I worked some people across the mountain when I was a boy. My aunt, my mother's sister, had a son the same age I was. <laughs> and said to my mom, Mr. Man named Marshburn, amazing how you keep all those Marshburn. So I worked over around his place. Two or three times. I very much like, but I didn't work there that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I remember the other boys like John Lewis and Prentice and all the others. But we were we were basically accepted the subservience to the white power. So, and we knew that the system, when you went to the system, the white man was up here, we were down here. Mm -hmm. 
And and people ask me, say, well, why didn't you uh, make up your mind to get on me back then? And I, the only answer I can give that even now is that in God's own time, he does that. And he does it at a time when under all circumstances, you know, because of, I, I should have been dead four or five times in Birmingham. But uh, been preserved. You were saying that uh, you knew the theocracy of race. Yeah, how white folk, high, white folk were here, black folk were here. Um, but it appeared that you was also saying that you never internalized that. I never internalized that the white people were superior to or better than Negro. Uh, of course, I was brought up in Negro tradition. We did some things that were different from white and so forth. Uh, and, and then uh, one of the things I think way back in there, you realized that black folk couldn't uh, look at white women too much. And even in, 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 in Mobile, as it comes to mind, I remember, I always have been fired. It's amazing that I hadn't done something and jumped over and got killed before God got me to this, but he does. I remember a guy, I was driving a truck, and they had a man in a lead squad of Negroes doing this common way. And he would just take his foot and kick them in the behind. Man, Mr. Pepper, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm driving a truck, and I see him do that two or three times. And it just something moved me to say to him, now, Mr. Pepper, I, I don't really understand why white people have to feel better to kick Negro. Well, I said, well, I, I, and I've seen you do that. I said, but I hope you will never kick me. I said, I just hope it never comes to that. Because I don't know what I would do. I'm sure I wouldn't take it and smile like they would. Well, preacher, you know I wouldn't kick you. You just turn it off. And then on the government job, Moby, Brooksville, another tall fellow. And people talk, preacher so and so, they like to talk to me. But I never back down. You know, in Mississippi, where I come from, he said, uh, when the, and when they said Negros, that was a good word for us. Mm -hmm. Negros passed through a certain way, they reach up and get the hat. When they get to the end of town, won't put back on until they get to the other. I said, well, I'm glad I didn't live there because I would not have taken off my hat. You don't need it. And the closest thing I came to getting fired in the government job, and I've always crusaded for people, as I recall, this thing we call, make you recall. The, 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 the captain, under the military, they had civilian. And the man who was oldest this part of the way, he was, his salary was making about $25 a day. And he niggled on the job. Some of the six and eight kids were making about five or something like that, less. Mm -hmm. you know? And I didn't know at that time that you can't leave folks strike on the government job. <laughs> and I didn't leave them into striking, but I just took them, a group of them, and went up to the captain. And talk to him. Well, the captain, he just treated me like he appreciated me by enough, but he called my former. And so my former told me, said, Sir Rep, said, said, he comes in. Come in there, Rep, minute. I want to wait one more. He said, You you know, you can't teach folks to strike on the government jobs. I said, I didn't uh, tell him to strike. I said, But you know yourself, or they ain't right. I said, Because you make more money than the average person is. I said, but it ain't right for them to have all them children, I do. He said, well, I understand, priest. I'll tell you what you do. See how God does it. Here's another thing about God. He said, he don't want you back in that section, but what you can just come in every Sunday morning, every morning, and let me and check in for you so I know you're here and going back home. I was all getting my pay for at least three weeks before I started driving back. Just going there to my head and going back home. And and uh, then it was during that time when I started driving back that they was tearing off all this stuff, tearing these houses, that I hold this, that truck and hold this, my house to build, enlarge my house. Mm -hmm. Everything. 
And I, I guess that comes in that uh, scripture that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord. You don't know you love them, and you don't know how much or how less you do, because none of us love them enough when we think about it. But, but things just come to happen. See? So it appeared then that you had a certain respect. I had a respect. That people, uh, that white people, um, wouldn't cross a certain line with you. Oh, yeah. Was it because you were a preacher, or because of something else? Well, I was respectful, but I recognized I was the same as other people. They respect me because I was a preacher. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I must have said. I think I did get a little bit more respect. That's why I could advocate. See, I've always even advocated for people who were less than or had less, and I do it now. I think one of the things we got to do now is start to, if they're going to give things back to state, we got to advocate that if people, poor people work, provide help so they can work and take care of their people. You don't poor people for daycare, you make for what? That's something else, but I realize you got to advocate. So you've always been an advocate. I've always been an advocate, especially for the underdog. Yes, and I've always respected the law. And I've always been in disagreement with segregation. And, and But I re recognize I'm in this system. And I always felt like guess that sometime, let's say God going to build up Zion Wall. Those old numbers, they have, they have. And you know another thing that, that come to think of, I've heard Negro, we have a way of kind of easing our consciences. We realize the white man was so bad. And I hear black men talking. And you talk talking about what white people do, white men. And one man said one time, said, white man got to go to hell if he don't stay but a minute. <laughs> he felt good just saying that, yeah. that God is going to equalize someday. All we said is a has a kind of an epic forward thrust that uh, you're going to reap what you sow. Oh, and maybe I can't do it, make you do it now, but but I've always felt as if God tomorrow has to be better than today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. but you, have, you have really enlightened me on, <laughs> on that, that whole structure, your whole, that whole part of your life that I'm just convinced that sort of set the tone for what you were going to be doing when you came to Bethel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, when I got to Bethel, I had gone through enough that I could be, I could know somebody didn't like me, but I didn't have to dislike him. And I could speak straight for always respecting however. That person's humanity, a manhood, a womanhood, or what. But I never said what I didn't mean. I don't do that now. Mm -hmm. See, I tell people, you hear me speak, my yay is yay, my nay is nay, and after that is hell nay. <laughs> and I think people ought to be positive. You don't have to be brutal. Mm -hmm. But I, somebody said brutal, I say, okay, I'm brutal and frank. Mm -hmm. See, and in that way, you're going to not, you, some people have turned off. I must admit this. But, I'm also conscious of my own experience that God will have enough people with you to do what you need to do and will give you enough resources with which to succeed if you want to succeed. I guess our main thing is, is the center of, of I mean, where we're going. Where we're going. And, and it's tragic now that the system has has, has so disillusioned so many people, especially black and some white people, mm -hmm. that they wouldn't care if this country burned down. Mm -hmm. And yet, we've got to realize that life itself is sacred, that we're put here for something. And we don't just, we don't just be disgusted with the system and anybody else and destroy our own self. Mm -hmm. Especially if the Lord came, we might have life and have it more abundantly. So that's the way I feel. And, 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 I'll be 75 years old if I live to see Mark. And I didn't expect to get, Mark's 18. I didn't expect to get 40 years. 
But I'm as committed now to trying to do things without violence, but with positives as I was then. And if you, you have asked me, or people do ask, have asked me, would you do it all over again? Feeling the same way and having the same drive and having the same belief that you can't lose if you're working for Christ. I do it all the same way. I go through the same thing. And you haven't heard, you don't know what I felt and heard, understand the public. I guess that'll come later. Yeah. Or in the fire holes and in the mobs. Right. Yeah. Well, this this is, is very revealing. And I want to give you a rest right now. Okay, so I'll then, then we'll, uh, we'll get, get back, back into that. All right. Yeah. Man, you have, I mean, you see, and I know that you, you know, you've got the uh, beginning, you can express these type things as you want. Yeah. It's clear what you want. Okay. You, you came to, uh, to Bethel in 1953. Yeah. 1954 was a monumental year because of Brown versus Boulevard. Supreme Court decision, yes, yes, sir. What do you remember about that particular time? I can't tell you what it did to and for me personally, except it was almost like a, a new baptism of faith or a new conversion or something. The court had declared segregation in schools unconstitutional. That was the biggest thing that happened. Negro almost since emancipation. Mm -hmm. um, we thought that that decision itself would do a lot of attitude, but it, it, it resulted in hardening the attitude of the southern states. Mm -hmm. um, I remember walking on 19th Street on the, in front of the post office, post office building. When I saw that, I can't tell you exactly what it did for me. And I'm sure it had the same effect as most people. It gives us hope. And if we, and those who had felt that there was no need to um, strive, I think it, it did something for them too. Uh, it didn't, it didn't awaken in me any new thing. I already felt basically the same day. I knew it was wrong. This was a confirmation by the whole high school to land. And I thought that the Supreme Court decision actually would have meant more than it did directly. Mm -hmm. Did you think it would at that particular time you were you were really uh, enamored about the possibilities yeah. as a result of the, the highest court in the land making right, this decision? Right, right. I was enamored over the idea that the highest of court had done it. We are law-abiding people, and so segregation has got to begin moving. Instead, you know, there would be all the officials of the southern states were allowed to get away with ideas of interposition and nullification. And with the latent Klan activity and the Klan mentality, and the abhorrence in most white people's mind of black folk being equal or the same as they were, even though they might not have uh, personally done things against black. But I think most white people felt as if they were better than black people. We had, we understood what the Klan meant at that time. By the same token, there were some who were more sophisticated who developed an organization called Susan White Council, Citizens White Council. Citizen Council, the Bird, John Birch Society, and all this kind of stuff. Yes. And even like now, we talk about racism. It's just a sophisticated word for segregation, mm -hmm. in my mind. Um, and that was time given by the court talking about, and took and came back in 55 talking about gradualism, didn't it? Right. Right. With all deliberate speed. All deliberate speed, but it didn't all anything done. Mm -hmm. And those 
few years caused much more suffering than would have been had the court mandated that the low courts see to its uh, order being carried out. Mm -hmm. Even if they had just made a beginning. Mm -hmm. It was really similar to the Emancipation Proclamation when it was signed in 1863. Yeah. Because it really didn't free any black people until, you know, the... Uh, Far later. That's right. Yeah. Two years later. And, and, and at each time, just as, as the, the, the carpetbaggers and other things took advantage then, mm -hmm. these segregationists were allowed because, you see, the Southern senators and they had seniority in Congress and everything, all the money thing. So that I don't really think the Supreme Court anticipated the resistance. Mm -hmm. That it did, nor the fact that that would take two. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's a justice that underlies, there's a justice, a line that, that underlies all we do. And Abraham Lincoln said it when someone had order when he says he hated that the war had to come. But if God wills it that the war can transfer every drop of blood drawn by the sword, by the lash, Whoops to my whooping black book. Shall be repaid in kind by one drawn by the soul. Why it's killing white. Even so, it must be said that the judgments of the Lord, that's in Psalm, are true and righteous altogether. So, you're going to reap what you sow. And the hardening, the resistance, and it's still, in one sense, being moved now. We, we talk as if we're going forward, and yet there's always a resistance, even in the very best of our politicians and so forth, to do no more than you have to do. And I think that, that has been a disservice uh, to the country. If um, we know that's the fact that they spoke that it couldn't go back on it. Mm -hmm. okay. We know that um, as a result of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, there was a lot of defiance. Yeah, that's what I'm what, saying. What, what though was the the mood of black folk? What did that do for black folk at that particular time? You mean the decision? The yeah, the, the decision. There was a re, there was a, an action and, and reactions from both sides. Well, for those who were leading in the movement, like myself and others, uh, the old NAACP people uh, all over that, that was really plodding along the legal lines of hopefully persuasion and legal persuasion. It meant a whole lot. It meant everything to uh, the average black Negro person that time we call ourselves. I think it, it had a lifting effect, but uh, it didn't always mean that because you feel better, you shout. But it, it, I don't think it had a, in a dereliction effect according, among blacks. I think all blacks basically wanted to be better off or equal to. And I think many blacks, like they do not, look for other folk to leave. Whether they fall or not, they still look for the people up front to leave. Whether they criticize them or not. For me, it was forward march, full speed. And now we got the legal background, go ahead. And I think that's one of the emphasis I had that some people, even see me reading that book, they didn't understand. Uh, yes, I did consider my moving forward as a mandate from God. I still do. Mm -hmm. I've never changed that. In 53-54, uh, were you active then with the NAACP? Yes. And what were you doing with that? What was your, your, your position? I wasn't in an official position. I would meet with, I was always moved to, to talk with shows. I was, on a, I was on the board of the local NAACP. See? Gwen. Uh, Lucinda Robin, uh, Cripple Man Ryle, J.J. Ryles, and oh, I don't remember some others. Right. 
Shoulders was a member, but he was a lawyer, basically, in Kendra. And there were several others, I don't remember. The emphasis at that time was voting? Voting and appealing to people to be concerned about whatever elections were had. Maybe your little bit could swing it one way or another. Uh, and generally, that's to talk to people about integrity and other things, as they always have. Right. But I was on the board. Yes, I was an active member of the uh, NAACP when it was our law. In fact, I was a membership chairman. Uh -huh. Okay. So, uh, now, prior to that, though, the Montgomery Bus Boycott took place in 1955. Were you we were active in that? Yes, we were there the first night. We met it at uh, Cold Street. Um, we went down. We established liaison with Martin Luther King and Ralph and others. And we went down continuously to sort of give our support to their leadership. So we were in it from the start. When did you first meet uh, Martin Luther King? I've been trying to figure out was it here or somewhere else, but I remember my first, uh, one of the first meetings I had with him was here in Birmingham. He had come to attend some affair here, and I believe it was, uh, I'm not sure it was Jim but it was somebody who had been working with Southern Conference, mm -hmm. who uh, uh, had arranged somebody else for me to be in contact because at this time, Southern Conference came over with red baby, you know. Right. And I'm not sure that Martin would have at that time wanted to be uh, identified. Right. And anybody could meet him as a, as, as a visitor. Mm -hmm. And in our interview, you probably want to talk about how we got civil rights and civil liberties combined because it was largely through me that it happened. Mm -hmm. But um, I met him and I was, I was impressed with him. I'm never old with anybody's personality. I realize all people are, people uh, at this time, maybe Emmett Jackson had something to do with it because he was enthralled with the fact that he had a PhD. But that time, if, if a Negro had a master's, he was good, right? he was, was considered quite a bit now, it might have been through Emory Jackson's effort uh, that I first met Martin or something. The, the Montgomery bus boycott, though, is termed as sort of igniting the movement in the South, particularly the career of, of, of King. It was. And uh, you were saying that people from Birmingham well, yes, were going saying. down to assist in, in that encounter. Now, were there any efforts to uh, keep people from Birmingham and from other places from participating in that by the police? Did they know that you were coming down back and forth? Because you didn't have the interstates at the time. You had some we did not have the interstates and at that time uh, the lines were not tapped in as much as they were. Uh, later on, mm -hmm. every time I pick up a line, I didn't hear what was going on in the police department. On the fire department. One time I got a four way hookup, which we talk about. Mm -hmm. There were some terrible things going on. But uh, there was one time after we had begun getting together, calling for a coordination of our effort, which terminated the SCLC, mm -hmm. culminated in the SCLC. Right. Uh, then the police started to uh, listing on my line, King, so that at the time when I was in jail here, of course this is later, mm -hmm. and King sent some men up, he called, and Bull Connor came out there and threatened the rest of them, he knew they were coming. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. But we cooperated to answer your question. Yeah. What was your role at Montgomery? Was there a specific role that you played? I knew you did a lot of speaking. Yes, that, okay. that was at first, boy, and, and then they appreciated any advice and ideas we would have, and you must remember that there were 
it was a national kind of thing, a national spotlight. So there were people from old who were talking with King. And that's how King got to be the national spokesman in a sense. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think he uh, took in a lot of people's advice. They were real appreciative of what happened from Birmingham as such. In terms of the, I know one of the issues that was paramount at Montgomery was that for the use of uh, the automobiles and getting insurance yes. for the automobiles. Um, how did that play to either uh, enhance the movement or to, to work against the movement? Well, I'm always honest about what I know about that. I didn't know as much about the, the, the inner working, but I do know they had people who were outside New York and other places who were interested in the movement succeeding. I think they got Lords of London, right? as I recall, and some others. I only heard about that. I never did know, see the papers and so forth. But mm -hmm. I wasn't involved in the personal inner workings at first. Right. You know. Did you have any, any dealings with E.D. Nixon? To know him well, uh, I spoke with him uh, several times, mm -hmm. and I thought that he was the, in a sense, the father and the gentleman of the movement because uh, he was here in the ACP. Right. And he indicated to me that he had groomed Rosa Parks for this job, mm -hmm. for this situation. So. Maybe unbeknown to Martin, before Martin got there, that was the seeds are always planted for goodness and righteousness and justice, you know. Somebody just picks it up here and there. Because it was suggested that Rose Parsons was really not the first one, of course, to be arrested on the bus. Right, and I think somebody else had, uh, as I remember Nixon talked to me, and we were riding a train one night, he explained a lot of things to me. And you know, Nixon was almost unknown. I, I used to get on Martin and rap about not keeping him before the people because I believe in people who have contributed mm -hmm. ought to be kept before what they have done. Right. And yet I realized that there are so many people clamoring for Martin and Rap's tent, and even government people. Mm -hmm. So in the movement, it was a terrific amount of uh, liaison with Washington and trying to get in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get have a problem with Martin because he wouldn't listen even here. Right. And I had said, well, now, wait a minute now, you know, Washington, D.C. doesn't want to bring me in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's, that's uh, uh, one of the classic controversies that you had. With, we get to that a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think what I'm saying is it's amazing to at that time the tremendous amount of outside even, even that early. That early. And, and interest, and, and everybody was hoping and thinking they had the answer. More than that, everybody thought, you must remember this, that segregation could be easily defeated. And this is what most people now who write about it, a lot of uh, writers, uh, they have their ideas, God bless them. And even King thought, and I thought to a lesser degree that if we just simply point out to the South how you bad you mistreat the Negroes. For example, when we when we organized the SCLC, we took over the idea of bus desegregation as a thing everybody could do. And we thought that uh, it wouldn't be difficult. And you must remember the slogan that we first used to redeem the soul of America. To, 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 to gain it, regain the consciousness or something like that. Right. We think that people would, 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 would just, in their own souls and hearts, think, now we ought not treat our blacks so bad. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't happen that way. And all, everybody thought segregation, a lot of people, 
But I know a lot of people who hope and everything. They hope that we could just get together and do a thing and it's it check it or die. Mm -hmm. Uh uh. No, no, no. It was you did that in Rico. When the uh, NACP was outlawed in the state. You're talking about a great big thing. Go ahead. What did I mean what did that say to to the world? About Alabama. The segregation is said to the world that Alabama, the Alabama, you must remember this wasn't just Alabama, it was Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Georgia, and you know, others. They were in cahoots, but Alabama is first on the roll call of states. Mm -hmm. Alabama had uh, a governor who I think wanted to be first, a, pa a pastor at that time, I believe it was. And uh, so that they want to do it first and did it first, as I understand now from history. Um, and 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 Judge Walter B. Jones would have issued an injunction against the son if peasants had asked him. The day that it happened. Yes. That the NACP was outlawed. What kind of experience was that for you? Because as you say, you were the membership chairman, chairman and, and I was on the meeting with two or three people. Paper served on me. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the issues that you wouldn't give up the, the membership role, right? Well, I didn't have to deal with that because I the membership role would have been kept. At, uh, in New York anyway, right. not, not in Birmingham. Uh -huh. And uh, so the injunction was served on us locally because I think the uh, Ruben Hurl and others were, they had the headquarters basically here in Birmingham. Right. And the injunction was served. Uh, I'll never forget that day that the fellow brought that. All that sheaf of papers, like when the unroller went down to the ground, what all that writing on it was, <laughs> and 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 uh, he he said that uh, we were in John, and I said, "What do you mean? Does this mean you can't do nothing?" And I said, "Nothing, nothing." I said, "That's not the destiny of black or Negro." Mm -hmm. Of course, Mr. the shows. We sent the Roman others. Uh, we were in John for meeting, remember, and for collecting memberships. And uh, uh, but we secretly met anyway, okay. got together, we face, uh, not openly, but we met together. I remember Lucinda Robe and J.D. Riles, and man that had the loans, the Gwen. And uh, several, a few others, for sure, but then one be. And Lucinda Rope and I were considered, I guess, hothead because uh, to me it was a, a, a tragedy to tell us that we couldn't fight for freedom. Uh -huh. And also, I felt as if the government, the Supreme Court, was allowing these people to disobey the law openly. You know, so they had called on folks to defy the law and everything. More than that, at the time in the AC was out on, you remember Hudson, I beat was a guy on the floor out of it. They said, well, we'd gotten an old goose lady on a golden egg or something. So I said, in my speech, I said, well, we, we fact, this kind of reply, you got this. Got the goose after she laid the egg, but before you got the goose, the goose had laid some eggs and then began to hatch. Um, Mr. Shaw in, the, in this meeting, I think we met two times, to my recall. And I was a little disturbed that they couldn't come up with a way to do something. But Mr. Shaw was in his legal understanding, kind said, when I didn't jump him, he said, didn't jump him. He said, and you go to jail for violating an injunction. I said, well, somebody has to go to jail. New Senator Robert said, well, that's right, and I'm one willing and ready to go. <laughs> I said, well, let's think about what we need to do. So Mr. Sure, this counsel, like he didn't 
He just confident that you could go to jail. The injunction meant you couldn't meet, you couldn't collect memberships, you couldn't do anything in the name of the Good to me meant nothing. Uh, Ms. Rogan and Rye, several of us met again without Mr. Shores to figure on uh, exactly if that anything could be done. And the idea was coming to my mind then that somehow that we're going to have to defy. Now, Ms. Rogan was just like I was. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I thank God. She said, that's right. They can't tell us we can't do it that way. That was right down my alley. Mm -hmm. You got some support in your idea. So I said, well, let us, let us let's pray over and take it over. God's got to do something. In fact, I knew. I knew that God was not going to let those segregations try on at this time. And uh, at the very same time, something else began happening. That uh, so things moved together, you know. We, 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 they're disjointed with me because people were calling me up since I'm membership chairman. And, and I had gone and made liaison with all of the civic leagues, they're all over this area, mm -hmm. Graysville, around, all around. Even out in so Alabama. Developed a network of folk, man. Right. Right. Around, this right. Mm -hmm. around, around the area. Around this area. Yeah. And not in Mobile or something like that. Not mm -hmm. we in Anderson, but right. around the county area and some other part of other counties. Mm -hmm. Graysville, uh, Dolomite. And, and people were calling me, and all the questions were saying, what can we do? What do we do now? I believe the injunction was, a, was a issued, I believe, a surge, I recall, on Tuesday morning. Tuesday? I think it was Tuesday. Uh -huh. One Tuesday was Thursday. Whatever they May 26. And uh, that'd be a Tuesday. And uh, every day, from the time it hit the news, I guess I must have gotten to start off with 50 calls, then 100. You know. And what can we do? Can we take up, can we send you a car and you send them to New York? And you, can we? I said, well, no, let's hold everything for a while and don't uh, do anything until we fail and call me back next week and we'll come up with some solution. And this is what I would say to people who call. So we'll have some sort of a solution within two weeks. Now, the NACP in Bessemer who was right at, did you know Asbury Howard? Yes. Did he work closely with you yes. in the development of this? We went with, uh, he and Miss whatever, Helen, whatever name was down there, and Miss Lawyer Hood and mm -hmm. us. But they didn't work with us in developing the movement. Right. We had worked with them on some things, Bessemer and others, even before the injunction. We respected each other. And I believe it was that Saturday morning, if I recall. I uh, knew the answer. I woke up about three o'clock in the morning, so seven. So I'm straight in the bed, wide awake. And it looked like something was saying to me, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you. And in my religious background, I understand that was God saying to me that you got to do something. You got to get the truth over. I tried to back down, but I couldn't sleep. So that mid morning, I had a few preachers I knew would go with me, and anything I tried that was right. Mm -hmm. Reverend Lane, who was at the Hargrove Church on the south side, we in Bethlehem. Reverend Truitt in North Birmingham, and Reverend L. J. Rogers at Shady Grove. I knew those three would go regardless. I didn't know about Alfred, and I knew Herman Stone would go with me, and God and Pfeiffer. I knew that, uh, and Nelson Smith. So I said to, 
I started calling around. I said, somebody got to do something. I said, and I'm thinking about calling a mass meeting. But scribble for it, lane and truth. I said, now, somebody had to do it. And if nobody goes with me, I'm going to do it alone. But it looks better if, if uh, more than one. I said, I don't, I hate people think all of one preaching and now in front of him can, can cause a mass meeting. I had the courage to do it. At any rate, I must have five or six. It's in that book, a lot of lines over the heads. And, uh, and I announced the meeting for Tuesday, June 5th. And I remember calling Reverend Alfred. Now, I could have had a meeting in Bethlehem, but I have always believed that everything shouldn't have been just my church, or even just the way I see it. And so I called Reverend Alfred and said to him, told him what I had thought of. He said, yeah, uh, yeah, let's, let's meet in my church. Meet in my church. I said, that's good. I said, that's going to be at Belton. It can't be anywhere else. I knew it would be at Belton. Meanwhile, Alfred, I as Alfred myself, uh, Lucinda Robe and a few others, George and Lola Henry, some others, uh, we had gotten together and talked about getting a statement of principles. Because I know it's, it's an educational thing, and you have to say something that's going to hopefully catch people. So that statement of principles, I had written it out. And I asked them for what they think about it, and they had they could add through to. You know, it's an amazing thing, Doctor. God gives you words for that moment that will stand. That's the only thing. I said, they can outlaw a movement, but they can't outlaw the will of the people to be free. And I made sure I put in it that the uh, Supreme Court way back there had ordered things, but now court ordered segregation, and, and here we are, something like this. So we call them asking. Of course, you know the resultant chaos in the press. Um, from, from from Saturday when it hit the press until at two, every 15 minutes, every hour. And of course, uh, I knew. And I said to all of them, now you have to guard yourself, you have to watch yourself because they're being cooked up there and thing. And I wasn't, I wasn't uh, actually hoping Somebody was told mom is my family, I'm not that stupid. And I knew that you didn't have a, an adequate defense against the Klan, neither would police help or uh, what we could do ourselves. I knew it. But I depend on God to do it. And of course, I guess uh, one evidence of the fear would be given well, the pressure. Take a picture and blow up of me and look like I'm larger than I am and much more black than I am. Mm -hmm. And then always, Reverend F.L. Schultz, 3191 North, 29th Aztec Clan, you know, where you're looking up. Yeah. Let's call me the Negro, blah, 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 for Tuesday night. And this went on all day Saturday, all night Saturday night, all day Sunday. And Sunday evening at about 9 30, Luke Beard, the pastor's 16th Street, called me up. He told me the Lord told him to tell me to call the meeting out. <laughs> Those were moments. And you know, uh, as I look back over night, you almost hate to uh, sit here, but this is history. That's right. And I have never intended to demean any man. King, uh, and we had differences, but God was using everybody. And uh, I said, Well, Doctor, when did the Lord start sending my messages to me? He said, Well, I'm not I'm not a friend of that thing, but I just I just think I said, You think uh, the Lord told you? Yeah, Lord want me to tell you, God. I said, Well, I'll tell you what, Doctor. Uh, you pray over. 
I said, because I think the Lord told me, he said, all right, you pray over it. You pray over it too. I said, okay, I'll give you some thought. I didn't take three things. Mm-hmm. The Lord didn't announce it. I'm going to read that. Mm-hmm. Someone told that story. Uh, I don't know. He said, he told you that the Lord told him to call Well, me. I hadn't finished that. Okay. <laughs> so at 1130, it's prime new guy on everything. TV. Right. He called me back during that time. Mm-hmm. Really, I've been praying. But I told him to go pray, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Lord really wants you to call that me now, but I was in no mood to talk. I said, well, Doctor, go back and tell the Lord. If he really wants me to call him, he has to come down himself in person and tell him. He to be sure to bring the identifying mark in his hand, his feet, and his side. And I just hung up because mm-hmm. I knew the meeting was blind. Now, he, I knew he was nervous, and I knew the Lord didn't use nervous preachers. Mm-hmm. So the meeting went on. Well, and Ware didn't like it, and M.W. quit, as you know, the two of our most outspoken critics. Mm-hmm. Ware tried to get the conference to almost go on record against it. And several ministers did speak up and said, We ought to do something. My God. Well, I said, well, brother, just don't say I'm good by it or bad about it, let alone if it's not itself. Next two, three weeks, just like everything else, these little people were trying to start out. Right. That's the way I was. Yeah, yeah. So I knew then that I wouldn't have an ally in him. But I made up my mind that I wasn't going to be an enemy to anybody. I wasn't going to contest or challenge preachers, even when they organized the Betterment Association. Yeah. We went on that night, and you couldn't get to Alpha's church. History had that. Mm-hmm. But Reverend Whit and Reverend Ware didn't come. And as the Lord would have it that night, uh, Whit and Ware wanted to start talking. Whit was saying, Oh, you little Negro, no, no, you're going to get yourself killed. And, and uh, folk wanted to put him out. And I said, No, doctor. Uh, now we've come to meet and you can say what you want to say. You can't give me that. I said, now you have to go and talk now. No people want you to say what you want to say. Yeah. I was in charge. Mm-hmm. And he went on down and say something about, you know, we don't get killed. I said, well, maybe the Lord wants some of us to get killed. So others of us can quit being afraid. Mm-hmm. And not a whole lot. I didn't have a lot of change. I didn't want to embarrass him. And I realized the people would have told talked him out anyway. Mm-hmm. And incidentally, we got him and Wally to take up the collection that night after this. But, so I gave one of those rip-roaring speeches. The people were ecstatic at that time. They were ecstatic. They were just the idea of a meeting, the idea of the state fair that they came. Mm-hmm. And my thought was, how in the name of God can folk can tell you you can't be free when God made you to be free? And I kept on that thing, Jesus said, you should know the truth. You should, the truth should make you free. And it was every word I said with this applause. And uh, so I said, now, we have to organize. And we had already gotten the initial thing ready, draft to be read, see, to be read. And uh, I asked them three times, because I didn't want them to, uh, just jump into something. So now what we get into, it may cost some lives. It may, it may, none of us may survive. I said, but we we have to do something for our sake and our children. Do you want to organize? They voted to organize. Then we read this thing that we had. Now book of our movement way back there. The, the preamble and what we believe in play our prayers and nonviolence. And they voted on that. I had to vote on it twice. Then they, all, they elected me president. <laughs> and I told them, if you elect me president, that means we're going to move. We won't be standing still. And Lucinda B. Rubin, bless her heart, I thank her for all the time. She developed the word that the movement is moving. It's supposed to move. That was our drive. So we were to challenge segregation in every form we could. That's why I'm sure that I've uh, perhaps served in which I have, because I believe in in uh, challenging on all fronts. 
And also, I'm not a person who asks other people to do what I want. I lead from a battlefield general. I believe in leading the troops to battle. I never ask anybody to go and do what I wouldn't do myself. And I guess when you get to where you really trust and believe in God and depend on Him, you go. And, and I was aware, I must say to you, I was aware that I could get my brains knocked out. I was aware that um, any day could be my last. But I wanted my last day to be a day on the battlefield for the Lord. And I literally be that thing. People are shocked when I tell them I tried to get killed in Virginia. But I literally, believe, I literally believe that writing in which Jesus said, he that loses his life for my sake should find it. And I recognize I had a family. And it wasn't that I didn't care anymore for them than you care for your family or others. But there was a counterbalancing understanding that even if I cared for them, I couldn't protect them if somebody wanted to kill them. Right. So go ahead and commit. Right. Yeah. What did you Since it is he that keeps thee, even he doesn't sleep. See? Mm -hmm. So that was, I had that understanding. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, what did your wife and your family feel about your fearlessness? You, you'd be surprised. We never sat down and discussed that. Mm -hmm. They knew me. They knew um, I never said anything in church or anywhere else that I didn't mean. And I think they felt as if God must have been saying something. Because I never back down. I never said, I said, well, wonder if you do this, what you're going to do. I never, that was never. So your wife never said, uh, you, you know, you need to never. slow down a little bit. Because never, never. You must remember that the day we went down to that uh, terminal station in 57, a long time away, uh, she went with me and I didn't have any weapon or nothing. One of the first issues that uh, the movement dealt with, uh, I think, was the uh, issue of no, having no black policemen. That is, yes, yeah, no black policemen and voting, yes, right, right. personnel department. Right, right. How did you approach that? How did you, what did you decide to do to, to elevate that issue? You have to remember that uh, the police department on the Bull of Con knew everybody's record or created a record for them. So you had to get somebody you hoped that was at least above board. And uh, it is God's way of, uh, what shall I say, rounding the thing up. Just like when the kids went to those stores, uh, they didn't have to buy anything, but we made them buy a handkerchief just to be sure, because the Lord would be up in court. What did you buy? Right. So that uh, covered the basis. Right. So basically, you did the same thing with the issue of the police. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the young man, I can't recall the name right now, was. Talked with, and we understood. And another thing we had to go against nobody can really sit down in a moment and figure out all of the things you had to think about and go through back there. Mm -hmm. You see, we had the problem Negroes would want to come up, act like they want to do something, and back out, mm -hmm. which would have been worse. Mm -hmm. We had to deal with all of that. And, and, and then we had to work with whoever would come up, whether it was school uh, integration papers or this, as to whether or not they would need protection and so forth and so on. So when you see me um, working with Colonel Johnson and others and people like in Armstrong, God gives you people a, a, a enough. You, every, you, God will see to it that you have enough resources to do. I never had to worry, and I didn't, there are many times I did think about when I was going on what was happening back to my family and so forth, but I, I didn't bother because I knew they were in the hand of God, and I was knew I was on a mission for God. So here too, we, we, we uh, made sure in our own mind that 
the young men had nothing in their record that, that could embarrass us. But the pastor was staying depressed and bull would do. And I think Dr. McPherson was one of them, was one of them on that period. And I think he, Dr. First, McPherson took the examination of a man with a third grade education and gave it to him, I think. Miss about what was quarter of a point or something like that. This just shows you how silly that could be. And Dr. McFord had a PhD. Right. And it all confirmed my understanding that no matter what you got, if you black, you have to be less than. But the policemen, the, the voting, mm-hmm. we were we were we were quite diligent. We stayed at the border resident. Here's one thing that 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 uh I thank God bless me. I, I, I have a church and I have a personality that's, that's sort of pushy. I realize that. And so when the first writes about me, mean I'm a dictator and I was pushing out, I, I said, well, okay, you call me a dictator. I said, I'm a benevolent dictator, trying to do what's good for us. Right. But I would, on my Sunday morning services, I would uh, call my members names out. So and so, are you rest? I always call my first name. No, I said, well, I'll be back at you in the morning. So it's that time. <laughs> One of the things that I remember so well was I had a real light skinned woman. She's still living. I said, Maude Ellen, she's light skinned, tall, tall and hour. And her husband was real dark, much darker than I, named Lonnie. So they were sitting in church one day. And remember, I put the name up on the board. I was the first church in North Miami having the rest of all of his members. All right. Yeah. And I said to my deacons, I said, I don't want y'all wearing these robes out there in carpet and can't get up and go to vote. You go watch them. One that loved me so well, I got him the rest and all. And, and, and so I would just give church, church Sunday morning. I said, Maud, are you ready for the vote? She said, right side of her husband line. She said, no, sir. I said, well, all right, I'll be down to get you in the morning. I'll be there by 7 o'clock. She said, well, don't come that early, Reverend. I'm going, but I won't be dressed. I said, if you don't mean to help you dress, be dressed. <laughs> this was the kind of person I was. And I meant no offense, and I think they knew this. But all of my members, the name up in the vestibule that come in. So that was sort of the badge of honor then. The badge of names. honor. I mean, and, and, I, and one of the things that I succeeded in was getting other churches, especially those close to me, to do a lot of registration, see. Because as you will recall, that blacks at that time, Negroes rather, was 40% of this population, 0% of the privileges. And when I'd go down to the courthouse, I was sickened in my heart to see old white people, decrepit, old, old sticks. And one man's body was, first time I ever saw a body look like an Aziz, it was a man at the courthouse who had been home, retired long ago. But he had, uh, and the only black people I saw in the courthouse were people who mostly swept the floor, not too many of them. And if any black person wasn't sweeping floor, I had a piece of paper, he had one that some white man had written something to another one on, he carried that way. And that just didn't sit well with me at all. And I turned to chain. So it's, it's, it's good to go to the court out now and see these faces. Uh, this even if we went up to the lunch a while ago, see all those young black Negroes, many of them perhaps who never would recognize me, uh, businessmen, how did they get there? Yeah. 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 yeah, and what did it take for them to get there? So that's that's the thing. But um, it was it was a thing, and I I never was dividing my mind about whether or not to attack segregation. That was never a question in your mind. It was never a question. All that thing. I think I said loading some of them to the library and this. And this. Uh, midfield at Kittyland Park and all e- everything that we uh, could do. And then when the uh, inter- intrastate thing was 
excuse me, with my wife and I went to the Temple Station as well. Uh, Carl and Alexina Baldwin was the first legal suit that the movement uh, filed. As a result of your tenacity that first year, so, between June and December, by the Christmas season, you know, I didn't have it. It was later than yeah. 56. Yeah, but I'm talking about 56 now. 56, yeah. yeah. As a result of that organization, that was an answer to you. Then God was going to seize it. Yeah. So I'll talk about that for a Well, you remember from June, the, the Montgomery uh, lawsuit was filed in, in, in 55. Right. That's right. See? And took it off that long to get up to the Supreme Court. In June, we started a meeting. And we met every, the first one was a Tuesday night. But I had the understanding that if we were going to really be more effective. We had to meet the next night from Sunday so we get around to all the churches. Mm -hmm. And so we got a thing going where in all of the churches uh, the movement would be announced see, on Monday night. See, mm -hmm. And it, 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 it strained it for years. Every Monday night, rain, shine, storm, this and that. Uh, it would take a long time to talk about the different types of harassment that the police did. Right. Uh, and from different churches. I never let it be in no one church. All around, we had a community against churches and so forth. That was done in the first year. First year, we met, we met right every Monday. Monday. Police would follow a car, rest for them, give them tickets. Mm -hmm. I remember one who met it, uh, as I recall that time, we were fighting this church in the middle of the block. But we start police get you by running on red light, middle of the block, mm -hmm. anything. But people came on. Mm -hmm. Unmitigated harassment and so forth. And it, in 58, it had gotten so that Dr. King came. He was shocked at how I dealt with the police. We talked about that too. Mm -hmm. You won't want to ask, but I don't, I'm trying not to get it all mixed up because yeah, yeah. mine yeah. is a myriad long story. But we're talking about that first year now. Right. The first year, the first, the first bombing. Right, yes. right. Well, I'm leading up to that. Okay. So by June, July, August, and September, we were so crystallized to the people in Selma. Emma Jackson did a great job. He always would announce where it would be. That was a hit. And uh, so we somehow or another felt the Supreme Court had heard the case in June by the time we'd organized. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, before then, before that. But that decision didn't come down in June. Mm -hmm. So we were expecting it in time after June, by the time we first organized. Mm -hmm. And somehow or another, Nelson Smith and I got wind of the fact that the Supreme Court decision on that was coming down. We felt, we knew it was going to be against segregation. Mm -hmm. This is the bus. Bus, he said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, we were at the TV station when it came to on the teletype. Mm -hmm. And so I said to Nelson, you must remember that God activates you and gets you ready to do this moment with the last generation. I said, now, we don't want all the clan to be in Montgomery. See, all the Alabama and South said, let's, let's, let's ask the commissioners to rescind the segregation law in the light of the Montgomery decision. Mm -hmm. And we knew that if we didn't threaten, they weren't going to do anything anyway. In fact, we knew they weren't going to do it, but we had to threaten them to let them know that something was going to happen if they didn't. Uh, so Nelson was for it. We got the, 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 the Decision Lola and Jordan and Lola would pack it up and we got to the press, all the press. And so that took some of the heat off Montgomery that here in Birmingham, we threatened we're going to ride if they don't, you know, that was a big thing. Instead, I'm going to go back and look at some of those headlines. And, uh, so we, we got that done and we knew they weren't going to do it. And we come up to Christmas, and I remember 
that uh, Christmas Eve, uh, our churches in that area met. And so they met at my, they met at uh, somebody else's church, but this time it was mine to preach. And I remember preaching from the text of Isaiah, sixth chapter, ninety six, right? Unto us a child is born, mighty counsel, mighty God. And I was preaching, I was calling myself swinging out. And I remember saying these words, and I don't know why. I said, I expect at some time now, any day, some clam will throw a stick of dynamite at my house. Mm. One stick, 16. Mm. But that Christmas night, 16 sticks of dynamite was placed between the church and the house. Churches breaking the house and the wood. And there was a metal, a cement thing at the bottom so that the implosive effect couldn't go into the break, couldn't go down this way, into the house. You go to that corner house, you got the picture here somewhere. Yes. I think you need to put it up in the library there uh, and under my picture so people can see. That's what me looking good. Mm -hmm. It was what you come out of that caused the movement to go. Uh, uh, and the corner of that house was blown off. And I felt the, the, it's around by nine something. And my deacon, Charlie Robinson's wife from down the street, always came to visit us on that Christmas day. Charlie Robinson? Charlie Robinson, I will be E on this And I, and he and his, his wife and my wife and the kids were on, in the other rooms. So he was, sitting beside me in the bed in the corner of the house, just like this thing was up against the wall. And he was sitting right in front of a mirror. That mirror, you know, dresser with the mirror, the mirror was as wide from here that corner. That, that was twice wide as this. Mm -hmm. And a little longer than it, about half again. And so it was a very big mirror on that vanity. And he was sitting right before that, but sitting right by the bed. So we were just in there talking. And We've been talking, I guess, less than an hour. It's been about an hour out there, about nine so Because he was just about getting ready to go. And all of a sudden, I felt something I never felt. And the, the, the lights went out. And I felt such a pressure I never felt before. And I felt the force of something, like driving me back. And yet, I understood something that I never, nobody ever told me. I understood. I felt a presence that, that, that I can't really identify. And the, this wall between my head and the diamond and the cone was blown off. Front part of the front wall was blown in the past the porch. This wall was blown. It was just the modest. And the roof came down, I guess. From up there to down here, and I'm down. The floor was blown out from under the bed, you see, as far from here. That's you were in the bed, laying in the bed, my shorts and undershirt. And your, your friend was there. Sitting right by the bed, in front of the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all of this floor and this corner was blown away. So I'm down in where the floor was, lying on the mattress. And it'd take a long time to describe it, but the, as we found later, the foot of the bed, bed feet, the legs, they've been blown off too. And right in this, as we were getting up to the debris, we found that a sliver of wood from this wall was driven in that bed thing, which would have come into my head with not for that. Where I was lying in the bed, a silver wood had been driven to that, sticking through that bed. But more than that, most of many slivers of wood from this wall was stuck in the center wall, not which was holding up the roof. I had a gabardine coat hanging up. Somebody gave me a wide fedora gray hat. I couldn't wear either of them anymore. I put them on that night because I didn't have, I had to go out later on the crowd keep them from getting, but I put the coat on on my, didn't even put a shirt on, but put my coat on. And went out. Was your family in the house? In the other room, right across, that night, 
Let that room, that the wall, that wall there. But that room was holding up the wall. That wall was holding up the, what was left of the room. This floor, part of it had been blown away, but had arced up. And uh, some of the uh, planks had gone up into a, a, a little heater we had on there. It was beginning to catch fire, and I put that out. And Charlie Robinson was sitting right by me, the bed, which would have come to about the bed that about halfway in the room. And that mirror that was behind him had been shattered, I guess, into a million pieces. And he didn't get uh, none of the glass cut. This was two, three little nicks of blood. And you know what his remark was? Well, I guess the Lord saved me because I was with you. <laughs> it's amazing that, that the shards of glass would have just, but the glass was shattered. We never just found a large pieces of glass. So it was shattered. So. And you wouldn't believe this, the spring that I was lying on, we never get no large pieces of spring. Metal shattered. Oh, but, but I was there lying on the mattress. And in a second, I knew what Moses meant when he said, underneath these, the everlasting arms. I never to smell, that, to smell that all that smoke dust from the years the house was on. Dynamite mixture, that, that accurate smoke. So Charlie had gotten out and gone back through, let go through that door. He couldn't, couldn't uh, let's see. The house was leaning kind of this way. So we couldn't go in that door, that door was, so he went out that way. But I took time to get my clothes out, and so the crowd began to yell on the outside. I could hear them. Everybody thought I was dead. Uh, my wife and children had gone out, so Charlie had gone out this door, this wall. It still stood. And, uh, but I took time and put this fire, because the head was going down. And uh, I could hear voices out there, the police naturally come. So uh, I, uh, I put this coat on and came out. And, and I hear James Revis.